guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. Today we are going to do a case study on the 1925 Tri-State Tornado. Yep, we have talked about this tornado a bunch before but we haven't actually done a case study and this is quite a big tornado in not only US history but world history. So today we're going to break it down, give you the details, the setup, and what exactly happened back in 1925. That's right. And to summarize, it was on the ground for about three and a half hours. It was a continuous path through three states from southeastern Missouri into southwestern Indiana. Mm -hmm. Longest continuous track. We'll talk about how it was continuous for 219 miles. And it was just absolutely, absolutely incredible. It's gonna be a really good case study today. But before we get started, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below. We we're looking at our analytics. We noticed that 85% of you guys who watch our videos are not subscribed. What are you doing? It takes no effort. Press that subscribe button, turn on the post notifications so you never miss another Meteorology Monday. It's a great time here. What are you waiting for? So some of the details we've been able to gather for this case study also lends to some questions as well. And these questions are, what could have been the outcome if that same exact storm happened today? Would there be more time to prepare? Would there be as many deaths and injuries? Would there be as much damage based on today's building codes? Those are all great questions and we kind of got an example of what this kind of storm would look like back in December of last year. Let's go ahead and dive into the Tri-State Tornado. One of the great resources we found was from the National Weather Service in Paducah, Kentucky. They state back in 1925, weather records were not nearly as detailed as they are today. With a lack of observing stations, data was sparser and forecasts were more vague. Therefore, the exact conditions that preceded the great tri-state tornado are not well known. However, given what we know now about the tornado development and using what records there were from 1925, we can surmise that March 18, 1925 undoubtedly would have been a candidate for a moderate or high risk of severe weather. So very interesting. So based on that information and the Storm Prediction Center standards and National Weather Service standards for what they look for for moderate and severe risks, this would have definitely been a moderate to high severe weather risk. Yeah, with a tornado like that, you're definitely going to have an atmosphere that supports that moderate or higher risk. So let's get into the setup of this storm based on what the National Weather Service says. So here's what's going on at the surface level during that. That morning, surface low pressure over northwest Arkansas and southwest Missouri tracked northeast across southeast Missouri, southern Illinois, and southwest Indiana during the day, reaching eastern Indiana that evening. Extending east from the low was a warm front, with a cold front trailing to the southwest. As the low tracked northeast during the day, its associated warm front advanced north, allowing warm moist air from the Gulf of Mexico to infiltrate the tri-state area. In fact, temperatures that started out in the 50s during the morning reached the 60s over most of the tornado track by 1 p.m., and even the 70s in the vicinity of Cairo, Illinois by 4 p.m. So, we know that a lifting mechanism was in place, and moisture was abundant with the Gulf open for business. Next, we're gonna take a look at the upper level features associated with the storm. We can also infer there must have been very good upper level support, given the fact that the tornado traveled at speeds up to 60 to 70 miles an hour along most of its path. We can safely assume that perhaps a 100 knot upper level jet max was nosing into the area from the west-southwest. With veering winds south at the surface becoming west-southwest aloft, wind shear was also present to help initiate the storm's rotation. There must have been decent instability as well, with warm air advection at the surface and probably cold air advection at the upper levels. So in that, there are a bunch of big words. Let's kind of break it down a little bit. What is the importance of warm air advection, cold air advection, and those veering winds? So advection, we've got warm air advection and cold air advection. Basically, advection is the movement of air from one location to another. So warm air advection is basically warm air at the source and that is moving into the region. And so the air will be warming up as it moves in. Cold air advection works exactly the same way, only the opposite in terms of cold air is the source and that cold air is moving into the region. So temperatures would be cooling at that point. So veering, we'll break it down, we'll make it simple. If you're looking for strong storms to form, uh, winds would come out of a certain direction and then they would turn with height. 
So as you start out at the surface, they would come in at the south or southwest direction here in the northern hemisphere, bringing in warmer air, warm air advection at the surface. And then as you go up in height, the wind starts to change direction or veer to the southwest, to the west. It's drawing in air from those sources, which in the US would be the Rocky Mountains. So cooler air, drier air would come in to the same region. So when you have warm air at the surface and you have cooler dry air aloft, the atmosphere tends to go, mm, I don't like this, I want to balance it out. And so what it does is it causes this overturning in the atmosphere to, because uh, warm air wants to rise, cold air wants to sink. Mm -hmm. So the combination of advection and veering Rolling. starts to cause those dynamics to happen in the atmosphere. Next we're going to take a look at what the National Weather Service says about the tornado's movement and how it devastated communities in its path. It all started around 1 p.m. just northwest of Ellington, Missouri, where one farmer was killed. From there, the tornado raced to the northeast, killing two people and inflicting $500,000 in damage upon Annapolis and the mining town of Ladena. Departing the Ozarks, the storm headed across the farmland of Bollinger County, injuring 32 children in two county schools. By the time the tornado reached the Mississippi River bordering Perry County, 11 Missourians had perished. The devastation mounted in southern Illinois as the entire town of Gorham was demolished around 2.30 p.m. There, 34 people lost their lives. During the next 40 minutes, 541 people were killed and 1,423 were seriously injured as the tornado tore a path of destruction nearly one mile wide through the towns of Murfreesboro, DeSoto, Hurstbush, and West Frankfort. In eastern Franklin County, 22 people died as the town of Parrish was virtually wiped off the map. The tornado proceeded unabated across rural farmland of Hamilton and White Counties, where the death toll reached 65. After taking the lives of more than 600 Illinoisans, the storm surged across the Wabash River, demolishing the entire community of Griffin, Indiana. Next in line were the rural areas just northwest of Owensville where about 85 farms were devastated. As the storm ripped across Princeton, about half the town was destroyed, with damage here estimated at $1.8 million. Fortunately, the twister dissipated about 10 miles northeast of Princeton, sparing the community of Petersburg in Pike County. In the aftermath, the death toll mounted to 695 people. At least 71 of those were in southwest Indiana. Property damage totaled $16.5 million. Nearly two-thirds of that was in Murfreesboro alone. So an absolutely devastating tornado event. One thing to note was how many farmers actually died in this event, which is really like a rare occurrence because, you know, farmers do that for a living. They watch the crops, they watch the skies. They're like basically meteorologists. They're like really good at reading the clouds. and that's you know their livelihood so the fact that so many farmers were caught off guard and the eyewitness reports actually said that it just looked like a dust cloud it didn't even look like a tornado it didn't even really look like a storm yeah and especially Crazy. in this part of the united states they are very well aware of weather yeah. severe weather especially in the springtime so southeastern missouri southern illinois southwest indiana you know they're accustomed to severe weather they would be looking out for tornadoes and know exactly like what to do and everything but the fact that it took them by surprise is a, yeah. a testament to what the storm actually was yeah and it, it looked different than what they were used to seeing so they yeah they, they were caught off guard and at the last minute it was unfortunately too late as a recap, when all was said and done, 695 people had lost their lives, over 2,000 people were injured, and 15,000 homes were destroyed. Of the 695 deaths, 234 of them were in Murfreesboro, Illinois alone, a record for a single community from such a disaster, and 33 deaths occurred at the DeSoto, Illinois school, another record for such a storm. Only bombings and gas explosions have taken higher school tolls. The property damage totaled 16.5 million US dollars. So let's round it out with some other statistics. What else did this tornado have? The storm moved across three states, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana, 
affecting 19 plus communities across 13 counties. While traveling along its 219 mile path, which took about three and a half hours, it averaged three quarters of a mile wide, with some accounts one mile wide. The average forward speed of the tornado was 62 miles an hour, with a maximum forward speed of 73 miles per hour. They estimated that the tornado would have been rated an F5, with some areas experiencing winds in excess of 300 miles an hour. At the Old Ben Coal Mine in West Frankfort, Illinois, a barograph trace recorded a lowest pressure of 28.87 inches of mercury, or about 977 millibars. That's very low. That's incredibly low, incredibly fast winds that match that low pressure. Fast moving, long track, just like breaking all the records at once. One of the other interesting things that the National Weather Service talks about is the correlation of the location of the tornado in proximity to its parent low pressure system. They state, what makes this tornado interesting though, is that its occurrence was nearly coincidental with the track of the surface low. While other tornadoes in the warm sector of the low affected parts of mainly Tennessee and Kentucky that day, none were as massive, long-lasting, or violent as the tri-state tornado. This goes against conventional thinking that while it is not uncommon for a tornado to occur in conjunction with the surface low, the most violent ones actually occur in the warm sector of the storm well south and east of the low's track. So, as it said, most of the time these strong and violent tornadoes happen in that south and east section of the low pressure system. And that is because, as we touched on earlier, you have your differences in winds. So near the surface you can have it going this way, and at the top you could have it more going this way. And that gives you something called wind shear. So these winds are going in opposite directions, it kind of rolls the air over, and it gives you one of the main components in tornado genesis. So for this instance, we had a very violent tornado so close to the low pressure system. That's weird because normally in a low pressure system like that, you have winds all going in the same direction. So you don't have that wind shear as much. Everything's pretty much going in the same direction. For this case, however, that close to the low, the winds were going in different directions. So it was a very strange situation for that low pressure system, which created the tri-state tornado. Okay, so why was the storm moving so quickly? Again, when major tornadoes, violent tornadoes occur in the southeast into the warm sector of the storm, they tend to move not as fast because the jet stream is displaced further off in a different direction. So you've got the storms moving at a slower speed because this storm formed so close uh, in association with the low pressure system, and that low pressure system was very close to the upper level jet, it caused that storm to actually cruise along at 60 to 70 miles an hour. So, 219 miles is quite a long path. <laughs> and there's a lot of discussion going around, is this actually a continuous path? Were there breaks? Were there multiple tornadoes? Was it a family of tornadoes? Why do the NWS think that this was just one tornado? Let's take a look what they said. So there's a discussion going around on whether this tornado raged on a continuous path or where there was a family of tornadoes associated with this event. According to findings from modern weather records and research, they suggest that a tornado that endures as long as this tornado actually results from a cyclical supercell rather than one massive storm. This means that the storm continuously cycles through the development stage, mature stage, and decay stage and the decay of that storm leads to the development of another, and so on. Each supercell may be responsible for developing one or more tornadoes. In these types of situations, a damage path like this can appear to the untrained eye as resulting from one tornado, when in reality it was more than one tornado generated by a cyclical supercell. The only problem with the cyclical supercell theory is that tornadoes spawned by cyclical supercells tend to exhibit breaks in its damage path when the storm goes through its decay and redevelopment phases. However, the tri-state tornado's path of destruction was continuous. There were only two sections of the storm's path where there was a slight decrease in damage at the beginning and at the end, possibly suggesting one or more tornadoes. So there you have kind of the reason why they believe this was a yeah. continuous path. This was quite the storm. Quite the storm. And of course, back in 1925, we don't have the records we do today. 
So there's probably more to the story that we'll just never know. So let's answer a few questions that we talked about in the beginning of the video. What would happen if a storm like that occurred today? Actually, like we said in the beginning of the video, we had the Quad State tornado in a very similar location of the yeah. country. And that went across four states, quad, four states, tri-states, states, three states. The joke to that, there's another video. It comes from a different video. <laughs> the real ones, though. <laughs> and we'll do a study on that. We're going to do a separate case study once all the reports are out, once the NWS is done with everything and we know the official you know, speeds, where there breaks, what are the total statistics. But we're waiting for all that before we do that video, but it's coming soon. So again, 1925 to today, would there be as much warning? Would we have more warnings now? I think we would definitely have more warnings. As we said before, the tri-state tornado kind of just looked like a dust cloud. It didn't even look like a tornado. But nowadays, we'd be able to see the signature on a radar and be able to really tell where that tornado is, maybe even guess at the intensity, and kind of give an estimated path and put those warnings out before you know, the storm got there. We've got much more advanced technology nowadays than we did back then. Yep. Not only satellite and radar, but also the way to disseminate the warnings out to the public. True, everybody's got a smartphone these days and can immediately get, you know, those emergency tornado alert, get to shelter. So with that, what would you say about the number of deaths and number of injuries if we have more advanced warning capabilities nowadays? would say that the death toll would definitely be less because people would be warned ahead of time and they would know what's happening. And that segues into would we have as much damage? Well, building codes have definitely changed since 1925. Definitely. Some people would say, yeah, we, we might have gotten worse because they built sturdier structures back then. <laughs> But, <laughs> not saying that a 300 mile an hour tornado is, is not going to completely right. obliterate something that's built nowadays. So you're still gonna have that kind of damage. But for generalized tornadoes uh, that are weaker, there could be less damage. In places where tornadoes happen a lot, there are often tornado shelters as well. I don't know if they had those back in 1925 as much as they do today, but they definitely have big areas for tornado shelters in towns and a lot of people have them in their backyards as well. So the loss of life might be less even if the damage is kind of the same. One caveat to that is that there's a lot more people living in those areas now compared to 1925. So there's a lot more houses and buildings for the tornado to hit. Yeah. So that could balance out the cost of damage because you have more there now. So there you have it, the Tri-State Tornado, March 18th, 1925. And we really were excited about this case study. We've been looking to do this for quite a while. So yeah, about a year almost now. Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was really good to dive into all the details and see how this formed. And there's still questions about it. Very interesting tornado, obviously very devastating, but a very interesting from the weather perspective, you know, with this tornado being so close to the low pressure. Mm -hmm. Again, if you liked a case study like this, give it a thumbs up, subscribe down below so you never miss the next one. Follow our social media over here for all of our weather adventures and all the links for everything that we use today, as well as our website and our Patreon will be linked down below. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. something in my eye. <laughs> I'm trying to do my face and, and my, my mouth is like, no, you can't. You got to do this. Oh, just show me crying. Yeah. That's the ending blooper. <laughs>